It was just another day until everything I knew was torn apart. I came home to an empty house, my wife, my kids, everything I held dear, gone. She didn't just leave. She took everything, including my heart, and ran straight into the arms of a man I never even knew existed. They thought I would crumble, that I would vanish into the shadows of my own misery. But they were wrong. What they didn't see coming was the fury inside me, the cold, calculated revenge that would turn their perfect little world into a living hell. Until 5.30 p.m., today was just a normal day. Let's see how it began. I woke up at 7 a.m., took a shower, got the kids out of bed, and then made their breakfast and packed their school lunches. After that, I woke Tracy so she could get 11-year-old James and 8-year-old Maddie on the school bus. She was tired from a late-night tennis match. After saying goodbye to the kids, I left for my job as foreman around 8. After a usual day at work, I headed home a bit after 5. Since it was payday, I stopped at the ATM for some cash for the weekend. But the machine took my card. It didn't give me any message. It just wouldn't dispense cash or my card back. Looking back, it wasn't smart to try to get cash with my credit card. Maddie's birthday was on Sunday, and I planned to buy her something special. But now that idea was out of reach, too. The bank was closed, so I just went home. When I got home, I saw that Tracy's car wasn't in the driveway. I hurried to the front door, worried she might have left the kids alone again. She knew I didn't like that. After the last time, I told her to call me if she had something important to do so I could come home early. As I was unlocking the door, I heard someone say, Mr. David Brown? I turned around and replied, yes. A middle-aged man handed me a yellow envelope with the name Slugden and Pike on it. He gave it to me and said, you have been served, and then walked away. I was confused. Once inside, the house felt empty. In just a couple of minutes, I realized not only was my family missing, but all their clothes and belongings were gone too. There was no note or message anywhere. All I had was that yellow envelope. Sitting at the kitchen table, I opened it. The first paper I saw was a divorce application. I had never seen one before, but the title was clear. It even had sticky notes saying, Sign here. I didn't read much more and moved to the next paper. This one was not easy to understand. After a bit, I figured out that I had two months to leave my own house because it was going to be sold. What? The third document was even tougher to read. Eventually, I realized a man named Michael Smith wanted to adopt my kids. Seriously? The last document was straightforward. It was a restraining order saying I couldn't go within 200 meters of my wife, my kids, or Mr. Michael Smith and his home at 12 Riverview Drive. I felt completely shocked. The huge changes in my life felt overwhelming. It was so big that I couldn't wrap my head around it all at once. My mind seemed to go blank. Then small pieces started to fit together. My wife had left me for some guy I didn't know. She had taken the kids and wanted me to let him adopt them. She had also closed all our joint bank accounts and wanted to sell the house for financial reasons. Her new partner was a man named Michael Smith, who lived at 12 Riverview Drive. What made it worse was my embarrassment. If Tracy had gone to these lengths, then things must have been building up for a while. I hadn't noticed a single clue. I didn't think Tracy was that clever, which made me feel foolish. I tried to think back to any signs I might have missed. Sure, Tracy had seemed a bit distant about six months ago, but when I pointed it out, she had quickly returned to normal. Our relationship, which had been fading, suddenly picked up again. She appeared more eager than ever. I smiled as I remembered some of the recent moments we had shared. But could those moments have been shared with Mr. Smith first? No, that just didn't feel like her. The thought hit me hard. She might have always wanted to explore new experiences, but her upbringing made it difficult for her to open up to someone she respected. The sad truth was that she had lost respect for me some time ago, which hurt. The irony was that while I was getting the renewed Tracy— Mr. Smith was probably getting a very different version of her. I had to keep that thought in mind. Having some laughter might help me through the tough times ahead. Still overwhelmed, I thought about what to do next. My choice could be surprising to others. My boss had once had a psychological evaluation done for all senior staff. I was pleased to see a line that said, Mr. Brown is not particularly rule-bound. 
It was a polite way of saying that I was a bit of a risk taker who focused on results and followed the rules only when necessary. At my performance review, my boss, a very serious person, told me, Dave, whenever I have a tough job, I give it to you. I write down how I think you'll do it and how long it will take. I'm glad to say I've never once been right. He then gave me the highest score possible, and we had a good laugh. Unfortunately, that didn't mean much, as I had already reached the highest point my qualifications would allow. Supporting a wife and kids had kept me from finishing my engineering qualifications and moving up. Thirty minutes later, I parked just down the road from 12 Riverview Drive. It wasn't very far. Tracy's car was there, but there was no sign of anyone. This was the most expensive neighborhood in town, and the house I assumed belonged to Smith was as big as the others on the street. Suddenly the name felt familiar. Could Michael Smith be that annoying guy from the TV ads? He always appeared in his own commercials, which changed all the time. He owned one of the town's few superstores. If I remembered correctly, he had taken it over in a tough business deal a couple of years ago. If I was right, then I was in trouble. This guy was wealthy. My thoughts were interrupted when the front door opened, and a man walked to his car and drove off. I recognized him as the same middle-aged man who had helped me earlier. This made me open the yellow envelope I had with me and read the divorce papers. It felt like a declaration of war. Tracy wanted everything, house, cars, money, support funds for the kids, all of it. I was also to be denied access to my children completely. I knew Tracy was competitive. She not only had to win everything, but also wanted to defeat anyone in her way. The petition was classic Tracy. I was still thinking about this when 30 minutes later the door opened again. An elegantly dressed woman in her early 40s stepped outside. She stood there as a large suitcase was brought out and set down next to her by a man who then went back inside and closed the door. The woman stood holding a yellow envelope just like mine. Finally, she rolled her suitcase to the gate and started walking down the street toward me. The look on her face matched the confusion in my mind. When she got closer to my car, I stepped in front of her. She stopped a little away from me, her eyes puffy and red. She held her envelope in one hand and a suitcase handle in the other. I lifted my envelope and said, snap. She looked at mine, then at hers and started to cry again. Without a word, I put her suitcase in my trunk and opened the door for her. Knowing we might be watched and that the police could be called, I drove away, taking some turns and parking a bit farther down the road. Surprisingly, realizing she was in the same difficult situation brought out my protective side and helped me think clearer. Even with her tear-filled eyes, she was a striking woman. Without any hint that she was ready to speak, I introduced myself. I'm Dave, and I think my wife knows your husband. She looked at me, her sadness evident, and managed a faint smile. I saw some of her sorrow ease as I spoke. I'm Wendy. Is your wife's name Tracy? I nodded. I caught them together last month. I thought we were working things out. Then tonight. She began to show signs of distress again and I gave her a moment to collect herself. Somehow, hearing that Tracy had completely betrayed me didn't shock me as much as I thought it would. Can I take you anywhere? Family or friends? I have no family nearby, and Michael has pushed away all my friends. Have you eaten yet? She shook her head. I checked my wallet. I had less than $50. I drove to a budget restaurant I knew and helped Wendy inside. To sum it up, we shared our stories. I was 32, Married in my second year of university and had to drop out the following year when we found out we were having a baby. Tracy didn't want an abortion, so I quit school to support our family. Tracy didn't work and I thought we had a good marriage. I felt a bit frustrated by her lack of motivation, but accepted it in our busy world. What bothered me was that Tracy seemed like a devoted mother around others, but in private, she was a bit selfish. I had stopped bringing it up. I was different. I showed love to my kids, whether in public or at home. Since my parents had passed, and being an only child, my family was everything to me. Wendy, on the other hand, was 41 and had been abandoned by her mother. Her father had done his best, but the stress had taken a toll on him. Her marriage to the much older Michael had seemed fine but childless. Michael blamed her for that, refusing to look into any fertility issues, pointing to his successful siblings. Wendy's inheritance had gone to support Michael's growing business. At my suggestion, Wendy went to the ATM across from the restaurant to check if her card still worked. 
The situation had clearly been planned well. We realized we needed time to think, but in that moment, having someone else's problems to focus on was the best therapy for me. Wendy wasn't ready to think about the future, so I offered her a place to stay in my large, now empty house until she figured things out. I emphasized my offer was out of kindness. I had no other intentions. We drove home, and I helped her settle into the guest room. We ended up sharing a bottle of wine. When I expressed my worry about not being able to see my kids as much as I wanted, she reached out and placed her hand over mine. Seeing my obvious pain brought tears to her eyes, showing her empathy in a way I found hard to express myself. Our shared problems could be seen as a classic therapy session. By the end of the first drink, we had some new insights. It was clear that the other side's tactics were meant to keep us off balance and too broke to get our own lawyers. Whatever Tracy's reasons were, she was definitely trying hard to win. The idea of splitting everything fairly after our marriage ended just didn't fit her character, so a smooth separation was out of the question. Wendy seemed like a genuinely nice person and would be a good emotional friend. We went to our separate rooms knowing we weren't alone in the world. The next day was all about distracting each other so we wouldn't feel overwhelmed by our new situation. When she felt down, I would tell her funny stories. When I felt sad, she somehow made me laugh. It was a strange day, but we helped each other through it. Wendy was a bit of a mystery. For such a beautiful woman, she was surprisingly shy. With no other money coming in, we combined our cash. With what I had in the kitchen and some careful shopping, we wouldn't go hungry for a couple of weeks. We actually enjoyed shopping like the people we now were. It was a big shift for Wendy, who had lived quite a comfortable life. We began to talk about making plans for the future, but stopped when it became too hard. That Saturday night, we watched a movie together. Sunday morning, Wendy was still in bed when I had unexpected guests. Tracy's father, John, and her younger sister, Beth, came over. I invited them in for coffee. We had always gotten along, and I suspected Beth may have had a crush on me. She had been alone for a few years since her husband left her. As the coffee was brewing, Wendy came into the kitchen wearing her robe. She quickly apologized and left, obviously embarrassed. John raised his eyebrow and looked at me with a cold expression. Before you say anything, Dad, that's the wife of the man your daughter is with. He kicked her out on Friday the same day I met her. I offered her a place to stay because she had nowhere else to go. So it's not just me your daughter is trying to hurt. I'm sorry, Dave. Tracy's mom was going to come too, but she's too ashamed. We know what Tracy did to you, and I want you to know I'm really upset with her. I stopped just short of saying we should cut ties with her, but you know how it is with family? I get it, Dad, and I appreciate your support. What I really don't understand is why she's behaving this way. I see her taking all the money, leaving me with nothing and trying to take our home. But what's her real goal? From his expression, I could tell he didn't know about the money and house situation. His eyes widened. You mean she took everything? Yes, Dad. All our accounts seem to be closed. I don't have anything left. She's asked me to leave the house and got a notice against me seeing the kids. John's eyes were now wide with shock as he soaked in the reality of what his daughter had done. He couldn't look at me. I'm sorry, Dave. What a nightmare. I can help with your question. She explained her reasoning to her mother and me yesterday. In short, money. She thinks that being with a wealthy man will give her what she wants. He's over 50, and honestly, she doesn't even seem that fond of him. If I were him, I'd be careful. I think after they marry, she might leave him for everything she can. That's rich, Dad. Her decision not to end her first pregnancy made me leave university. If I had continued, I would be in a better place now instead of where I am. John simply shrugged. So why take the kids, Dad? We both know she isn't exactly the nurturing type. Why not just take the money and leave my kids with me? I... I don't know, son. At that moment, I noticed Beth looking at her father with disbelief. But she didn't speak. Embarrassed, John apologized again and left after shaking my hand. I asked him to give my daughter a birthday hug for me. Beth hugged me and whispered, I'll be back in an hour. It was quite interesting. Wendy and I were having breakfast when two friends of Tracy and I dropped by. They had seen Tracy with an older man at a restaurant the night before and were curious. I explained our situation and Wendy shared her story. They were both upset about Tracy's actions and couldn't understand why she took the kids. They saw through her act of being a good mother when people were around. 
Just as we were finishing our conversation, one of Tracy's friends arrived. We told her everything, and she was just as horrified as the rest of us. We hadn't gotten far into our discussion when Beth returned. She pulled me aside and handed me an envelope. There's $1,000 in this, Dave. Let's call it a helping out my sibling loan. Please take it. It was hard for me to accept the money, but I really needed it. So I took it and thanked her sincerely. I also wanted to say Dad wasn't completely honest with you. Tracy came by yesterday and dropped off the kids. She shared most of what's happening. I found out more later. I have to tell you, she's playing a very complicated game. The idea to go after the money and the house was not my idea, but her own. They plan to use the money as a way to negotiate. They will agree to give it up if you cooperate with the divorce and allow him to adopt your kids. He really wants someone to pass his wealth to. After the divorce, she has made him believe she wants to build a future with him. This way, he gets his legacy, and she maintains her lifestyle. If you can hold on until then, I'm sure she will lose interest and let you have Jimmy and Maddie back. I looked at Beth, shocked. But it was all too clear in a cold way. He already had a glamorous partner, which explained his interest in Tracy, even if she wasn't the best choice. The idea of having a partner who could be by his side strongly attracted him. Still, I couldn't accept Beth's last words. Tracy had serious health issues in her pregnancies, and during her second operation, she decided not to have more children. Clearly, she hadn't told anyone about that. This showed me just how deceitful my wife had become. How did Tracy seem when she talked to you, Beth? If you want to know how she feels about hurting you, then she does feel guilty. She tried to hide it, but I could see it was weighing on her. She understands she's hurting a good person, but we both know her, and that won't stop her. What about you, Beth? Why are you helping me? Because it's the right thing, Dave. My sister always made my life harder when we were younger. What she's doing to you is just wrong. It bothers me. I know what it's like to be left behind. You were there for me when my mistake abandoned me. Not Tracy. I'm glad I can support you now. I've always liked you, and I can't stand to see you treated this way. I don't know what to say, Beth. I can't promise. No, silly, I don't want us to become a couple. That would be strange. Besides, I'm seeing someone now, and things are getting serious. I'm happy for you, Beth. You've always been my favorite family member. I hope it works out with him. Thanks, Dave. Just know I'll help however I can. Think of me as your ally. We shared a hug, and she left. I went back to Wendy and our friends. By the end of the day, we had to explain the situation to a few more friends. Their support helped. After we cooked dinner together, we talked about what comes next. I took $400 from Beth's stash and shared it with Wendy. I showed her where I hid the rest. With Beth's help, I thought we could make it until my next paycheck. I told Wendy what Beth had shared, and she didn't seem shocked. Her inability to have children had been a growing problem in her marriage. Wendy pointed out that I often felt tense at this time of night. It's 8.30 p.m. I've always read the kids' stories and put them to bed at this hour. I noticed a tear in her eye as she said, What are we going to do? My top priority is the well-being of my kids, and that certainly doesn't include leaving them with those deceitful people. I also need to ensure I can take care of them, so I'll focus on financial support. I'm unsure about revenge for now, but the idea of leaving them without consequences bothers me. What about you, Wendy? Her expression grew serious. If he had just asked for a divorce and offered a fair share of everything, I would have been okay with it. But now I feel humiliated. Please don't take this the wrong way, Dave, but I want to see him face the repercussions of his actions. She said this with such passion that I promised to stay on her good side. I smiled to show I understood. Now we know what we want. Let's figure out how to achieve that. We stayed up late brainstorming ideas. We examined all possible ways to gather funds for lawyers, mostly sticking to legal options, but we weren't making much progress. Without a clear path, I asked Wendy about Shithead's wealth. They had moved here two years ago, and he had spent a lot on buying a house and a business. Later, he borrowed $2.5 million to expand his business, which seemed like a weak point. We thought about how we might use that against him. If we could threaten his business, maybe we could negotiate better terms for seeing the kids. I didn't care about the money, but my kids were everything to me. Wendy was all for attacking his business, while I felt uneasy about hurting anyone's means of living, even someone like him. We went to bed later than we should have for a Sunday. 
On Monday at work, I shared what was happening with my boss. He offered his support, including emergency leave and an advance on my pay. I tried to stay focused on my work, but it was tough. I missed my kids every minute of the day. In the afternoon, I decided to spend time with the financial manager and lawyer at work. I should mention that people often look down on those of us at local government jobs. Everyone knows it's a safe job, but it pays poorly. So we stick together to support each other. When I was managing some road work with extra materials, let's just say the financial guy and the lawyer didn't have gravel driveways. By the end of the afternoon, I understood much more about how business finances worked and the limits of the law than I did in the morning. When I got home, Wendy and I talked about our days. She had made dinner after spending her time looking for a job. She used to be a personal assistant before she decided to become a stay-at-home wife. We were relaxing after cleaning up when a phone call and a visitor changed everything for me. At 7.30 p.m., the phone rang. I answered it. Daddy, where are you, Daddy? It was Maddie. I felt a lump in my throat. I'm here, sweetie, at home. I don't like it here, Daddy, please. Then I heard Tracy's voice in the background. Madeline, who are you talking to? And the line went silent. Wendy noticed my worried expression and asked who it was. I replied, Maddie, and started to move toward the door. Wendy tried to stop me. Even though she was small and I was much bigger, I was too upset to think straight. Don't go, Dave. That's what they want. They want you to break the court order. Please don't do it. Her words made me pause. Instead of going out the door, I went upstairs to my room to be alone for a while. I'm not sure how long I lay there, but then I heard a soft knock on the door. It was Wendy with three of the kids' books. Will you read me a story? I looked at her and then at the books. I quietly moved over so she could sit beside me. I picked one of Maddie's favorites and began to read. By the end, I felt calmer. I leaned over and kissed Wendy's forehead, just like I had done with Maddie for eight years. She smiled. Until now, I had pushed my thoughts about my kids aside. The idea of losing them or them living in broken homes was too much for me to handle at that moment. Just then, the doorbell rang. I was surprised to see Sophia. Never. Sophie standing there. She was Tracy's best friend, and I always got along well with her. I invited her in and introduced her to Wendy. Sophia seemed uneasy and had trouble meeting our eyes. After some small talk, she said, I just wanted to apologize to you, Dave. Tracy put me in a tough spot because I knew some things before they happened. That's why I haven't been around much. She made me promise not to tell you about her choices. I'm sorry. I tried to convince her not to do it, but once she sets her mind on something, there's no changing it. I knew she planned to separate from you and fight for the kids. I didn't say anything when she stopped talking. Here was a girl feeling very guilty. My first reaction was to see her as an adversary. If she thought I would feel sympathy for her, she was mistaken. But then a thought hit me. Maybe she could provide me with valuable information. Guilt can push good people to share more than they should. It's okay, Sophia. I understand how hard that must have been for you. Thanks, Dave. You know she closed our accounts and left me with nothing, right? Yes. She was expressing her feelings about it when I saw her tonight. I think she feels extremely guilty about what she has done to you. Up until then, Sophia struggled to look me in the eye, but now she looks straight at me. For what it's worth, Dave, I never believed what she said about you and the kids. I've seen how you and she interact with James and Maddie. You would never do that. What? Didn't you know? She told child services you were hurting the kids. They couldn't take action because there was no proof but just the claims were enough to get the restraining order. The shock of this news made me sit back in my chair. How could she do this? I was a much better parent than she was. Both of my guests looked at me, seeing my emotions shift dramatically. I was only aware of one feeling, deep, unyielding anger. As my mind cleared, I knew exactly what I had to do. If one side plays fair and the other cheats, the outcome will be clear. I realized I had to fight back as hard as I could. How far will she go to win? I've never hurt my kids. Yes, I can see that in you, Dave. It didn't make sense to me when she told me. I know many fathers who go out to bars or fishing, but you spend every moment you can with your kids. I see you with them, and I know you would do anything to protect them. Absolutely. They are my future. What a deceptive person. Do you know what her entire plan is, Sophia? 
We've heard from a source that she intends to use our money and house to gain full custody of the kids. Then she wants Wendy's husband to adopt them. Meanwhile, she will tell him she wants to have a child with him. He really wants a child, it seems. I'm sure she will wait to have a child until they are married, claiming she wants their child to be born after they are together. But she can't have another child, Dave. I know that, and you know that, but Mike doesn't. By the time he realizes the truth, she could have given away half of our little house and savings for half of his wealth. The harm to me, the kids, and you means nothing to Tracy. Me? Yes, you. What kind of best friend lies about a person's character? I watched as the truth hit Sophia. Her best friend was not who she thought. Clearly embarrassed, she made her excuses and left. I tried to retreat upstairs to be alone again, but Wendy offered me support with a gentle embrace. Neither of us said a word. We sat together in silence, both of us feeling pain and looking for comfort. After a while, I thanked her, and we went to bed. I'm not sure how much Wendy slept, but I barely slept at all. My thoughts kept shifting between what Tracy had done and the hurt I felt from Maddie's call. I think I finally dozed off around 4 a.m. when I had a plan worked out in my mind. Suddenly, I was woken up by Wendy throwing open the curtains. Good morning, sleepyhead. Breakfast is ready. After I took a shower, I went downstairs. Even though it was early, I called my boss and asked for some time off. He easily agreed. Wendy looked at me from across the kitchen table. Wendy, how far are you willing to go in this fight? David, I didn't know you cared. She flicked her hair back playfully, smiling as she said this. I smiled back. Cheeky. I meant how tough are you okay with things getting? Try me. What do you have in mind? Not much, just planning to take down your husband's business and ruin my wife's support network. Nothing too serious. That sounds like a good start. I have some ideas, too. We shared our thoughts. After breakfast, while Wendy looked into laws about slander, I called Tracy's mother. She had no clue that Tracy had involved children's services and was very surprised by her actions. Next, I called Beth to share the news. She was ready to cut ties with her sister, but I convinced her to hold back her anger and help us quietly. By the time I finished my calls, Wendy had gathered useful information, and we worked together to make two signs. A little later, Wendy and I were sitting in deck chairs outside Michael Brown's shop. I knew from research that the building wasn't private property, so we were safe. Our chairs were set up so they didn't block customers. I held a big sign that said, Talk to me about how the owner of this store took my wife and kids. Wendy's sign said, Talk to me about the morals of my husband. It became clear that more people wanted to speak with Wendy than with me. That's no surprise. She was much more charming. Soon I noticed a pattern. People hesitated to stop for me alone, but if one person did, they felt comfortable to join in. When they did talk to us, I shared my side of the story. Wendy's research showed that it was completely legal to share the truth in our country. As long as we were honest, we wouldn't face any legal trouble. Almost everyone we spoke to decided not to shop there that day, clearly upset by what Tracy and her partner had done. In between chatting with the public, we had some notable visitors. Just before lunch, the store manager came out and told us he might call the police. Wendy recorded me as I offered him the police's non-emergency number. The police came a little after lunch and after speaking to their superiors, asked us to move our chairs back a bit. Our confidence grew around 4 p.m. when a local radio reporter wanted to talk to us. A small crowd formed as Wendy and I shared our experiences. The audience was particularly interested when I mentioned the accusations regarding my kids, which were very serious matters. The reporter promised to keep to the facts we shared. We stayed to say goodnight to the manager as he locked up, promising to see him in the morning. We were thrilled to see ourselves on the local news that night. The next morning, we greeted him again. Not long after that, two security guards arrived and positioned themselves between us and the people passing by. I called the police again. They came and spoke with the manager, likely reminding him about our right to speak freely. I treated them to coffee from a nearby van as we became the center of attention that day. Wendy's outfit drew attention too. She could easily act if she wanted to. We didn't notice two men in suits coming toward us because we were too busy watching the news van arrive. I was handed a cease and desist letter, claiming they would sue us for a loss of business now estimated at $30,000 a day. 
As the scene was being recorded, the men quickly left us to speak with a journalist about our situation. We made clear to stick to the facts and asked them not to exaggerate. I held up the official document for everyone to see. After another successful day, we returned home when the store was closed. Many people stayed around, waiting for more. We hurried home to catch the evening news. I jokingly suggested Wendy should get an agent. However, my heart sank when we saw our segment. There were cameras outside of the house of the people involved, and I felt pain seeing my confused children hurried away after school. That night, I read Wendy another story. We were getting about ten phone calls each day from friends and acquaintances who were upset about Tracy's behavior. I thanked them and suggested they show their support by distancing themselves from her. It seemed like Tracy was becoming the loneliest person around. At 9.30 p.m., Sophia knocked on my door. She didn't reply to my hello. Instead, she came in and gave me a very tight hug. After she let go, she handed me a memory stick without saying a word, then hurried out with tears streaming down her face. Curious, I took it inside, and Wendy and I connected it to the computer. We were shocked to find a recording of Sophia confronting Tracy about her dishonesty regarding her family and the service that helps children. It captured Tracy trying to explain her choices as Sophia moved on from her friend. Our excitement lessened when we realized that the recording, even if compelling, was made without permission and wouldn't be very useful. We briefly considered sharing it anonymously with the media, but that would cause trouble for Sophia. We knew we had limits to how far we wanted to go. The next day brought an unexpected visit from Reginald Pike LLB himself. He tried to take action against both of us, but we weren't cooperating. After all, one of us had to record everything. We were both being sued for a lot of money. What a waste of time. They knew we didn't have anything to give. After that excitement, we returned to our quiet watch over the store. Yes, it was quiet. There were hardly any customers that day. Perhaps other stores selling the same things as Mr. Smith's were increasing their advertising, sensing a chance to take more business. To pass the time, we filmed ourselves and our few loyal customers. Whenever a delivery truck arrived, we made sure to film that too, especially capturing the supplier's logo clearly. Maybe we could convince them to stop working with the store at 2 p.m. Our two anxious employees came out of the store. They told us that during a staff meeting, they had been warned that some might lose their jobs. That hurt us. Wendy even interviewed me to encourage other businesses to consider hiring any staff that could be let go. We saved that interview for later. At 3.30 p.m., we were surprised when the state news van showed up again. Right on time, three more men in suits arrived, this time without ties. In front of the cameras, they introduced themselves as more lawyers, moved by our story and the unfairness of it all. They offered to help us with our divorce cases for free. After the cameras stopped rolling, their leader, Brian Coulson, explained that he used to work with Pike and Slugden but felt betrayed by them. We invited them to meet with us in Wendy's office, which was really the coffee shop across the street. They were still there when I finished my day, so I joined them. After a few coffees, we signed agreements for them to represent us in our divorces and my custody case. Brian's eyes lit up at the mention of Sophia's recording, but we chose not to share it with him. We assumed his views on ethics were less than straightforward. As time passed, our story started being featured in the local news, usually at the end of the segment. That night, Brian looked great on the news, wearing an open neck shirt. I thought of our relationship as a partnership where we help each other. He got to ride our wave of attention while we gained his legal support. That week, and the first half of the next, went by without much change. I missed my children more than ever, and my back was starting to feel stiff from sitting so much. Brian made sure there was media coverage as we requested a court order to help with our finances and see my kids. The public was interested, which made it easier for us. It seemed the local news reporter had a soft spot for Wendy, too, which helped our case. Thanks to the attention, we managed to get our court hearings set for the Monday of the following week. In preparing for that, I started to see some tough edges to Mr. Colson, and I admired that about him. We avoided visiting Shithead's business on Thursday, but when we heard customers were starting to return, we took up our watch again on Friday. I was glad we did. At 9 a.m. on Friday, Shithead himself drove into the parking lot, followed by police cars with flashing lights. 
It seemed driving a flashy car with personal plates was not the best idea. It took the police a few minutes, but they eventually found something wrong and issued him a citation as they left. Wendy filmed me while I filmed her as Shithead walked into his store through the front door. We wanted to show that any interaction was from him and that he had broken our restraining order. An hour later, Wendy spotted more suited gentlemen getting out of a car with a local bank logo. They went into the store and Wendy decided to go over. It's the 24th today, right? She asked. All day long, I replied. Guess whose loan payment was due yesterday? I just smiled. We decided to call it a day early. My holiday pay had just been put into my new bank account, which felt like a reason to celebrate a bit. Instead of our usual TV night, we decided to go see a movie. That weekend, I had trouble sleeping. With the first court hearing about my family coming up on Monday, I was very anxious. On Saturday, some surprise visitors came by, which was nice. An old friend of Wendy's had seen some news and wanted to reconnect with her. Later, Tracy's parents and sister came over. I quickly went to the store and we ended up having a barbecue. Wendy was great at keeping everyone entertained while I was out. While I shopped, I thought about why our visitors had come. I figured Tracy's parents now knew I was trying to do the right thing and thought I might win. They probably wanted to stay connected with their grandkids. We had a lovely time together. At one point, Beth managed to pull me aside. Is your back okay, Dave? She asked. Yes, all fine, Beth. No pains like there's a knife in your back, maybe? What? Is your sister upset? Well, you're not doing what she expected, Dave. You were supposed to be begging by now. Your protest at the store really surprised them. They're not happy at all. Tracy is furious and blames you, of course. My sister is playing innocent. Mom and Dad won't even talk to her, and Sophia was the first of her friends to leave her side. According to my sister, she and her boyfriend are even scared to go out to eat. Others have said things, too, even at the country club. Keep going, brother. You're winning. Oh, how unfortunate for them. How are the kids? They're okay, Dave. A bit sad and confused, as you'd expect. I visit every couple of days to play with them. Here, look at these photos. She showed me some pictures, which made me emotional. In one photo, my little Maddie was smiling, but it looked forced. I thanked Beth a lot for her efforts, and we went back to join the others. Just as she was leaving, she pretended to drop a bunch of keys. Oh no, I seem to have dropped a key for a fancy car. Your wife's car keys and a house key. How careless of me. We both had a good laugh and went back to our friends. On Sunday morning, as I was waking up, I heard a voice calling, Hey, sleepyhead, it's time for you to make breakfast. So I made breakfast, wrapped a towel around my waist, and pretended to be a room service waiter as I delivered it. On the third Monday of my holiday, Wendy took me to the family court. That's when I had my first real look at Mick, the man who had caused so much trouble. Wendy stiffened when he walked in. He was overweight and losing hair, unlike when he had first met Wendy 15 years ago. Since they weren't family court experts, Slugden and Pike had brought an associate along. He was an old friend of Mr. Colson, our lawyer, but he was still working hard for his client. Colson began by presenting my case regarding finances, and then the other side responded, claiming Tracy needed our money to support the kids. After presenting my request for shared care, Colson tried to get an order for the children to be interviewed so they could share their thoughts. The other side blocked that suggestion. Then their lawyer talked to Tracy, who had been glaring at me all morning and asked for a short break. He and Colson whispered for a while before Colson approached me. Your wife wants you to know that if you don't back off, she will make serious accusations against you. She's willing to give up everything if you agree to let her keep the kids. I glanced at Tracy, who looked quite pleased. I turned to Wendy for support. She had been switching between smiles and frowns all morning based on how we were doing in court. Coulson said to me, You know what you need to give me, right? I took a small voice recorder from my pocket and handed it over. Sophia had given me permission to use it if necessary. Coulson went back to the other side, and I could see their lawyer's expression change when he heard some of the recordings. Soon, the opposing lawyer left the room, and when he came back a little later, he sat next to Tracy without a word. The judge returned from a short break. The lawyer stood up and changed his tone. Your Honor, I must inform you that we can no longer represent the defendant in this case due to new information that has come to light. Tracy looked shocked and confused. 
The judge acknowledged the lawyer's exit, and we all watched him leave. I leaned closer to Colson, and he whispered to me, It seems our tape scared them off. Don't worry, the judge knows what's really happening here. Before I could ask what this meant for me, the judge made it clear. He adjourned the case, giving Tracy two weeks to find a new lawyer. He said he wouldn't make any decisions about money until we figured out where the kids would live, which we hadn't done yet. Plus, he wouldn't lift the restraining order because there were still claims of mistreatment that needed to be addressed in court. It was hard to accept that I had to stay away from my children for another two weeks. He also postponed Wendy's case. Outside the courtroom, there were no reporters around. They were busy chasing a more exciting story about lawyers leaving a client. That evening, Slugden and Pike put out a statement mentioning words like conscience and doing the right thing. There was a lot of gossip flying around. I didn't feel like celebrating. I just missed my kids. I could see Wendy was also feeling the stress. She seemed troubled about depending on me. I reassured her that I wouldn't have made it this far without her support. I dreaded the idea of spending two more weeks sitting outside a store. It was becoming harder and harder to get attention from the media. I imagined doing something drastic just to get noticed. Instead, I decided to skip Tuesday and just check how busy the store was throughout the day. Just after lunch, my phone rang. A man named Henry wanted to meet at a coffee shop across town. I asked Wendy to watch from a distance with a camera, just in case anything questionable happened. Henry turned out to be the assistant manager of the store. He wanted to keep this meeting low-key so that no one would hear about it. To my surprise, he asked me to continue my presence outside the store. It seemed the bank wanted Mr. Smith to sell the store quickly to pay off debts. They didn't think they would get any money back while he was still in charge. Henry and the staff were secretly talking to the bank about a buyout. Wendy and I were pleased to get back to our usual spot. Later in the week, I received more good news from the lawyers. Wendy had given them some paperwork during our first meeting. One of those papers was an agreement related to her inheritance, which purchased her a part of the business that was meant to pay her every month. She had reinvested that money into the business, and the total had grown significantly. We finally had Saturday off. The store had decided to close that day to save on payroll. We invited Beth and her parents over for another barbecue, along with Wendy's old friend. Beth updated us on the Smith family's situation. It didn't sound good. Apparently, Tracy had become paranoid and suspected Beth of betraying her, so she hadn't welcomed her visits lately. I was a bit worried since I hadn't heard from my kids. Just as we finished our meal, the doorbell rang. I answered and found Tracy standing there. Are you supposed to be here? I asked. Apparently, if I visit you, it's fine, she replied calmly. I let her in, but she froze when she noticed her parents. Wendy looked at her with displeasure and then went upstairs, followed by Beth. The tension in the room was thick. Tracy appeared uneasy and pulled me into the kitchen. Dave, can you just lighten up a bit for old time's sake? She asked. Why? Is everything going as you planned? I shot back. Of course not. I thought if I took all the money in the house, you'd give in and let Mick adopt the kids. Then when I remarried, we could tell the new husband he couldn't have kids with you and take him for everything. Tracy looked down at the table, clearly uncomfortable. I was going to come back to you after I got his money. I thought I could enjoy being with someone wealthy in the meantime, but you messed that up. His business is failing, and it's hard for me to go out because of what you said. The last time we went out, someone spat at me. The police have stopped me a few times this week, and I'm close to losing my driving license. I was shocked to see a tear in her eye. Can you please let me have a part of my dream? She pleaded. I thought you studied history. Don't you know that those who ignore the lessons from the past are likely to make the same mistakes? Your approach to our family reminds me of situations that led to complete failure. If you had approached me respectfully about a divorce instead of affecting our marriage, we could have split everything fairly. Now, I require nothing less than complete honesty. I can't believe you thought I would trade my kids for money. I could see she was beginning to realize how she had miscalculated things. Her focus on her own desires blinded her to what really mattered. Okay, Mick wants to talk tonight. Can you come over? She asked. Yeah, right. Come over and get arrested for breaking the restraining order? We could meet at your place, she suggested. No, why not? 
because if Mick comes anywhere near me, it won't end well. She was surprised by my reaction. What has he done to you? Let's see. Both people on the phone were chatting away, but I wasn't really paying attention to what they were saying. Then the doorbell rang. With Wendy getting ready, I went to open the door. It was my kids. As soon as I opened the door, they jumped on me, talking excitedly. James, who was about as tall as my chest, hugged me on one side while Maddie clung to my leg. I felt tears coming again. I was so happy to see them. I caught bits of their words like, I hurt my wrist, and Auntie Beth gave me a camera. I asked Wendy to keep our online friends busy for a bit while I took the kids somewhere quiet. Once they settled down, I asked them what happened, one at a time. They said their feet hurt from walking through the night after leaving the mansion. Maddie had a bruise on her wrist, and I felt upset when I heard that. James had decided to stop eating for three days. They were learning about it in school, but didn't realize that for it to work, people needed to know about it. Auntie Beth had given James a camera, and he had recorded their mom saying, Make your own breakfast. The kids were shivering from hunger and exhaustion. I gave them some milk and told them to drink it slowly. I let them know a nice lady named Wendy would come to take care of them soon. I returned to the kitchen and asked Wendy to help the kids. Then I took a deep breath and sat in front of my laptop. Tracy noticed something was wrong but stayed quiet while the other guy started talking. I ignored him. Tracy, where are the kids? They're upstairs in bed. No, they just walked through the dark to get here. I took a moment to calm down. My eight-year-old daughter has a bruise on her wrist that she says you caused. They both told me they haven't eaten for three days. Tracy responded first. We'll come pick them up soon. No, that won't happen. I will not leave them alone with you. If I see you anywhere near, I will do what I need to keep them safe. The guy smiled, thinking he had gained some advantage. Thanks for that. Then the call ended. I made sure the conversation was saved on my end and went back to the kids. Maddie was sitting on Wendy's lap, happily talking about horses. James was close by, looking at her. I shared some leftover pizza and reminded them to eat slowly. I knew what was coming, so I took the camera from James and put the files on my laptop. I created a folder for the video and added some important clips. I took a moment to take pictures of Maddie's wrist and added those, too. We had about half an hour before the doorbell rang. Plenty of time to hug the kids until they felt better and to call Beth to ask her to come over. When I finished, Wendy was reading a story to them. Then, two women from child services knocked on the door around 10.30 p.m. I let them in and offered them some drinks. They were a bit defensive, insisting they were there to take the children back to their mother. I'm afraid I can't let that happen. They tried to push the issue, but I showed them Maddie's bruises and got her to explain how she got them. I asked James to talk about his hunger strike, then showed them the video of Tracy yelling at them and another clip of the man saying, when I have my own kids, I won't care about yours. Are you really going to send them back to that place after they walked here in the dark? They both looked uneasy. I'm sorry, sir, but we have to follow the current order. You've been accused of mistreatment. If we leave them here and something happens, we would be in trouble. I stayed calm as I answered. If you send them back to a place where they have been hurt, you will need to answer for that. Are you threatening us, sir? No, just giving you a heads up. Before the lead officer could call the police, I proposed a different plan. I told them my wife's sister was on her way. If everyone agreed, I was willing to hand the kids to her as long as no one tried to take them from her. The senior officer left for a while to call Tracy and then came back to say it was all set. I figured Tracy and the other man were fine with that. I could imagine them celebrating the situation. I said goodbye to my kids with a heavy heart, promising to help them. They liked Auntie Beth, so they took it well. Wendy didn't say anything as I stepped away to gather my thoughts. The next day, Wendy suggested she help Beth get the kids ready for school. I agreed. For the rest of the week, she picked them up from school and took them to Beth's. I continued working since I felt it wouldn't help to stay home waiting. A call to Henry confirmed the store was doing poorly, but plans were moving forward. The following Monday, we were all in front of the same judge. Tracy and I had prepared everything except for custody, so we focused on that. Wendy went first this time. Both sides talked about her and Mr. Smith's financial troubles, including the unpaid money. Mr. Smith looked very worried when it was mentioned. 
The group working with him was from out of town, and they didn't seem very good at their job. The judge said he would wait to decide how much was owed until the accountants could check the unpaid money's value. He said the split would be 65 35 after Wendy got her share. He admitted he was being tough because Mr. Smith had acted unfairly. Wendy said she was fine with Mr. Smith keeping the house once he paid her. She knew it was important to him as a sign of status, and she didn't want to live there anyway. In my case, their lawyers made a mistake by saying that their illegal Skype recording should be used as evidence. We agreed to this, which confused their lawyers. They only played the part where I seemed aggressive. They also brought in Tracy, who claimed that I had not treated her or the children well, aiming to portray me negatively. I remained composed while they spoke. When it was my turn, Beth and Sophia came in to express that I was a much better father than Tracy was as a mother. Beth spoke so passionately that the judge double-checked if she was really Tracy's sister. Tracy was caught off guard and left the courtroom during this moment. Then I took the stand. Mr. Colson guided me through, describing a previous incident, the kids walking to my place at night, and the bruises they had. He brought up the hunger strike, ensuring to note that Tracy and her partner were unaware it was happening. He also presented statements from the children, collected by child services, regarding those issues. Since the other side introduced the Skype recording, they couldn't prevent us from showing another segment of it. This part included Tracy reacting when her partner expressed indifference towards my children. Mr. Colson also attempted to show a video taken by James, but the opposing side tried to block it. The judge did not approve of this. Gentlemen, this isn't a criminal court. The same rules don't apply here. My job is to do what's best for the children, and I take that very seriously. Mr. Coulson, you may show the video, and may I hear that other tape I heard about last time? So we saw Tracy as we listened to her instructing her children to make their own breakfast. But it became more concerning when we played a recording of Tracy confiding in Sophia that she had misrepresented things to child services about me, stating it was all Michael Smith's idea. The judge observed her intently during the last moments of the recording. She buried her head in her arms. Michael appeared displeased as well. When the opposing lawyer was asked if he had anything to say, he stood there looking stunned. The judge had one question for me, and I anticipated what it would be. Mr. Brown, can you explain the statement you made regarding Mrs. Brown and Mr. Smith? I should also mention I've heard about troubling behavior towards child support workers. I was prepared for this question. This time, a man was about to express something important to another man. I stood and looked the judge in the eye. Yes, Your Honor, I can. You have heard the same evidence I did. My children were put in a dangerous situation. I believe it is my duty, my privilege, to protect my children from harm. I would do anything for them, just as I'm sure you would for yours, Your Honor. I threatened those who hurt them, and I would do it again without hesitation. For a moment, I thought the judge might show his admiration. He nodded and then left the room to think for a while. He returned less than an hour later. I was given full custody of the children, while Tracy could see them only under supervision at my discretion. I heard a gasp from Colson. He had never seen that before. The judge ordered that all legal costs could not come from shared money. I received the house and 65% of the liquid assets. Again, the judge said he was being tough on Tracy because of how she handled the situation. You could see the journalists writing furiously. Several approached me outside the courtroom, but I was so happy I didn't recall much of our conversation. Wendy took the kids home while I gathered their things from the mansion. Tracy and her partner argued the whole time I was there. At home, I just hugged my kids. That night, they wanted Wendy to read them their bedtime stories instead of me saying she was better at it. I couldn't blame them. I had read those books many times. The next night, Wendy and I hosted a party with Mr. Colson and his team as our special guests. Two journalists were there, and I hoped Colson got the attention he deserved. I heard him explaining the term pro bono to one of them. Tracy's family came, along with many friends of ours and some of Wendy's friends. Even my boss showed up, making a few jokes about having a celebrity in his department. I raised a toast to Beth promoting her to favorite aunt. It was getting late when the party turned into just family. I sat at the table with Beth and her mom. John was dozing on one couch, while Wendy was reading to the kids on another. Then my mother-in-law brought up a tricky subject. 
Dave, how much time are you going to let Tracy spend with the kids? This question had been on my mind since the day before. I'm not sure, Mom. It depends on what she wants. If she wants to see them, I won't stop her. The kids could use a caring woman in their lives, right? My former mother-in-law shook her head. You know, Dave, for someone smart, you can be a bit foolish sometimes. What do you mean? Your kids are over there with a woman who clearly cares about them, and you. I quickly turned around, nearly knocking my chair over. Wendy looked up to see three people staring at her, one with a surprised expression. She understood right away and turned to touch pink. I walked over to the couch, knowing my next words weren't fancy, but they were sincere. Well, it seems there's an opening for a mother. Would you like to take the role? In response, Wendy stood up and came into my arms. We shared a warm, lingering moment as the kids squeezed in close to us. It all felt so perfect. After tucking the kids in bed, we said goodbye to our guests. I carried Wendy toward our bedroom. On the way, she asked, Did you propose to me before? Yes, I did. I thought so. Did I accept? Not officially. Why do you ask? Well, I think I might be out of your league, but I'd love it if you went back to school when I get some money. Sounds good to me. But who is out of whose league here, really? Epilogue. Tracy never reached out to me about seeing the kids, and they never asked about her since Wendy kept them busy. The bank helped sell the store to a group of managers and staff. As a local figure, Henry asked me to unveil a large sign saying, Under New Management, for the press. The store turned a profit by the end of the first week, and soon enough, Wendy's bank account grew much larger than mine. She took cash while her ex got the big house and enough to start over. People said Tracy was still with Michael. Things might have stayed that way if I hadn't bumped into Mr. Smith one day. He made a comment that unsettled me when his appeal started. I asked Mr. Coulson to monitor the court records for me. He found out everything was on pause while the couple enjoyed a month-long cruise. It was purely by chance that a fax came through for Mr. Smith while they were in port. It contained follow-up care instructions for a woman named Tracy Brown after a medical procedure from nine years ago. Little did I know, the ship was docked in a place that frowned upon men harming women. As an honest person, I never asked Wendy how so many homeless people ended up in the mansion and damaged it. I was aware, though, that insurance companies usually don't pay out when people leave their homes unattended for a month. Now, where did I put those keys Beth gave me? Was that a burnt-out car I saw on the roadside yesterday? At the end of my first year back in school, I offered to go part-time until I graduated to help with our new baby. But Wendy said she wasn't sure how long she could manage being married to someone without a degree. The nerve. Before moving on to the second story, please let me know your opinion. Do you like the story long or short, a series or separate parts? The comments section is always welcome, and don't forget to let me know which of these two stories you like better. Story 2. Pride. Chapter 1. Laura and Pete were in the departure lounge waiting for flight 3425 to Bali, holding hands. After all the planning and packing, it felt great to finally be done with everything. Laura closed her eyes, feeling tired after an early morning with little sleep. She needed this vacation after a long year. Just two weeks of sun and relaxation would be perfect. Pete let go of her hand to check his phone when he heard a message beep. Hey, remember to switch your phone to airplane mode? I didn't bring my phone. Pete glanced at his screen but then tensed up. What's wrong, Pete? He nervously handed it to her and she read a message. Peter Ower, touch that woman and you will regret it. Oh no, Pete, this isn't good. You must have let your wife know something, she knows. That's impossible. I packed everything last night while she was sleeping. She was really affectionate when I got to bed and gave me a warm gesture of affection this morning. It can't be her. It must be a mistake then. No, it includes my name. Could it be your husband? Don't be silly. He has no clue. He thinks I'm just away for training. Plus, how would he know your details? We've kept this secret well. Who is the message from? No idea. It could be a trick from one of my quirky friends. Let me call Penny and you can call your husband. Do they seem normal to you? Laura watched as Pete dialed a number. When it went to voicemail, he left a message saying he missed her already. After hanging up, Pete looked at Laura with curiosity. Are you going to call your husband? I forgot my phone. You can use mine. 
Laura started to reach for Pete's phone, but then they both realized it might not be a good idea. For the first time, Laura felt a little regret about her choice. Their conversation paused when it was time to board the plane. They stood in line but felt awkward holding hands in public. Laura noticed Pete looking around for people he might know, which she found slightly funny. He continued looking as they headed to their seats. Once seated, Laura looped her arm in his and rested her head on his shoulder. Why didn't you bring your phone, Laura? It's all part of my plan, and you'll be proud of me when we're in the air. A half hour later, the plane reached cruising altitude and Laura pulled out her laptop. She logged in and opened a document. I've made a plan for our future. When my husband goes to bed tonight, he will find a letter from me. If he agrees with it, then this trip will be the start of something new for both of us. Here's a copy. She handed the laptop to Pete. My dear husband, I love you and have since we met 25 years ago. I look forward to spending many more years together. You mean everything to me. I've dedicated my life to caring for you and our wonderful children and have asked very little for myself. I know you want me to be happy, so I want to share an idea with you. I've written this letter so you can take your time to think about it. If we discussed it face to face, things could get tense, and I don't want that. I've left my phone at home so you can't reach me for these two weeks. I'm not working, and no one knows where I am, so don't try to contact me. Darling, I love being with you but I also miss the excitement of meeting new people. I've never been unfaithful to you, and I won't be without your support. Here's my idea. With your blessing, I would like to have experiences with other men. I believe I need more than what one person can provide. It would never be someone you know, and I promise to keep it discreet. If anyone suspects anything, I'll stop. You'll always have me, and nothing will change in our relationship. You will always come first in my life. Please think about this for the next two weeks. If you care for me as much as you say, I hope you will consider this. While I'm away, the thought of your love will stay with me, and I believe this will bring us closer. If your answer is no, I will understand, but I would like to talk more about it. If you say yes, just say, the answer is yes, and we don't have to mention it again unless you want to. Your loving wife, Laura. After reading the letter, Pete said, Wow, it's good, isn't it? I have to admit I borrowed some ideas from a story I saw online. Why do you call it a plan for our future? Because I'm asking for my husband's permission. If he agrees, then we can move forward without feeling guilty. Laura thought to herself, Well, I'll have some time with you, but it might be different when I return. Do you think he will agree? Of course. I framed it in a way that makes him feel he has a choice. If he says no, we'll keep doing what we have been doing. How do you think he will react? It's well written and reasonable, but this isn't just about logic. Many men worry about their performance. The idea of me being with someone else might make him insecure. Laura looked at him and said, I think you're wrong. I know my husband. He will appreciate my honesty and take it seriously. By asking before anything happens, there's no risk. Pete glanced at Laura, wondering how much she really believed in her own words. He felt uneasy. He had twisted some facts to get this time away from his wife, but Laura's confidence in her husband was unsettling. He decided to ask another question, driven by curiosity and a bit of frustration. What happened in the story about the couple you mentioned? Did the woman get to enjoy herself? Before she could speak, the serious look on her face told him everything. No, her husband kicked her out. To steer her away from second-guessing her choices, Pete changed the topic. He wanted to keep her distracted, hoping she would maintain the carefree spirit they intended for this trip. I didn't tell you about a strange person I saw at check-in, did I? He was standing about 25 feet away while I was waiting. When I caught him looking at me, he just stared and made a gesture across his throat. It was really unsettling. Laura responded casually, what did he look like? There are all sorts of odd people in the world. That's the thing. He looked like just a regular guy. Over six feet tall, dark hair, a goatee. Pete stopped talking when he noticed Laura suddenly sit up and search for her laptop. She quickly opened it and pulled up a photo of herself with a man in front of a house. With a concerned voice, she asked, Is that him? It could be, Laura. It looks like him, but I can't be certain. Laura studied Pete's face closely. Did he have any reason to be dishonest? 
Would he be worried that if she realized her husband was onto them, their plans could change? For the first time, she considered how Peter was untrustworthy, given his willingness to deceive. What was the guy wearing, Pete? That's a tough question, Laura. Not many people pay attention to that kind of detail. Didn't you say he dropped you off at the domestic terminal? Yes, he did. I told him to just let me off and go. I took the bus to the international terminal after he left. So he would have had to go back to his car, drive to the international terminal, find parking, and then know who to follow in the check-in line. That seems pretty unlikely, doesn't it? I think it was just a random person acting strangely. He sensed that Laura looked unsure, so he tried to divert her attention. Is that your house in the picture, Laura? She switched gears, eager to discuss her home, something she was proud of. Yes, it is. Nice, right? We bought a beach property as an investment. It's steep and narrow. You wouldn't believe the house is a demountable. My husband worked on it for 15 years, adding more and landscaping around it. Each room has its own theme. The bathrooms and lounge have nautical themes. The study has a business theme. The atmosphere leads you to focus. I won't tell you what the bedroom theme is, though. We've won awards for the interior design and how it fits the land. There's even a creek running under the house. Their conversation shifted to family, a topic they hadn't touched on before. Pete shared stories about his two kids, ages six and eight. Laura talked about her three children, Sarah, 23, a recent law school graduate, and her two younger kids, Danielle, 16, and Larry, 13. She didn't realize she was trying to distract herself, but it worked for a while. Then she took out her notebook and wrote down, Lawyer, House, Kids. She was unsure if her husband suspected anything, but she knew she should protect her home and family. As the silence grew, Laura began to reflect on her true feelings. She started putting together a timeline of her actions. She had packed the night before, being careful not to bring anything unsuitable for the weekend. She planned to buy swimsuits and other necessities while on her trip. That night, her husband had been completely normal, and they had shared a gentle moment. The next day, she went to work as usual, and her husband picked her up from the office. They had dinner with the kids and then spent the evening together. She had felt particularly excited about the weekend ahead. Saturday morning came with an early start. Laura recalled feeling nervous when she suggested her husband just drop her bags at check-in and leave. He usually stayed until her plane took off. She had felt relieved when he agreed. She watched him until his car drove away, and now, looking back, his quick departure felt more troubling. She compared his actions last night and today with her careful planning. No one at her job knew anything except that she'd taken some time off, and her husband didn't know anyone from her workplace. He couldn't find out what she intended to do. The text she sent to Pete's phone was just a lighthearted message, and the man in the check-in area was just a passerby. Just relax, Laura. What if he did know? She had misled him about where she was going, but so what? The letter she wrote said she was going away with a friend from work, but it didn't specify who. She suddenly realized she'd been lost in thought until her eyes popped open. She envisioned her husband knowing her true destination at the airport and how that might look to him. The deception would appear as if she was hiding something, which was serious, but she could come up with a reasonable explanation. However, with the letter, she felt less equipped to justify her actions. Laura spent the rest of the flight stressing over how to resolve things. First, she needed to take care of that letter, hidden under a pillow, 2,500 kilometers away from her. Second, she had to convince herself that her worries were unfounded. Being thorough, Laura wrote a long email to Sarah, knowing she couldn't send it until they reached Bali. In it, she asked her daughter to go to her house and do two things. First, she wanted Sarah to grab her phone and redirect it to Pete's number. She explained that she was too shy to admit she'd forgotten her phone and had bought a prepaid one for the trip. The second thing was to find the letter under her father's pillow. She urged Sarah not to read it, mentioning it was very personal and something only shared between her and her husband. Laura knew she could trust her daughter to follow her instructions and to keep it confidential. She also asked Sarah to let her know once she received the email and when she completed those tasks. As soon as Pete and Laura got off the plane at Denpasser Airport, Laura sent the email and then, hoping her husband wouldn't notice, called him from Pete's phone. There was no answer either time she called, not even after they cleared customs and reached their hotel. This was unusual and made her nervous. 
Right before their taxi reached the hotel, Sarah called from Pete's phone to confirm she had completed her tasks. Laura managed to navigate a few questions about what was going on. When Sarah inquired if her father was okay, it sent a wave of concern through Laura. Her father had called to say he needed some time to think and was taking her siblings to their holiday cabin in the countryside. Sarah was going to join them that evening. Laura remembered asking her husband about his plans that weekend, and there was no mention of the cabin. To make things worse, the cabin was far from any modern communication. Distracted, Laura let her daughter end the call without asking any more questions. Chapter 2 Laura's husband had just grilled burgers for his three children at the cottage. They were asking him to take them spotlighting to find a wallaby for their favorite stew. Sarah noticed her father seemed distracted since she arrived, but decided not to push him on it. They were sitting around for a family meeting when Sarah started the conversation. Is this about mom, dad? Yes. She's been acting a bit strange for a couple of months now, kind of distant. Then yesterday and today, I discovered some odd things. A heavy feeling filled the room, worsened by their father's sigh as he finished his sentence. They knew him as a strong but lighthearted man, so they waited for him to explain. Your mom told me she was going on a two-week course for work out of state. All three children agreed that was what she'd told them, too. Yesterday, she asked me to pick her up from work, and I did. While I was waiting, I saw her talking to a man through the office window. Something about how they were standing together seemed off. She didn't come out for over five minutes. I wandered around and noticed a wall with pictures of all the senior staff members in the company. I recognized the man she was talking to. His name is Peter Auer. I took his business card from the reception desk. I couldn't sleep well this morning, so I looked through your mom's purse. I found her passport and noticed a visa stamp for Indonesia dated three weeks ago. I remembered seeing her reading a brochure about Bali last month. Their father paused, looking around the room, deciding how to continue. Bali is overseas, not just out of state. I didn't mention anything to your mother because accusing someone you love of lying is a big deal. Sarah spoke up. We know, Dad. You and Mom taught us to never cheat, never lie, and always treat people with respect until they lose it, then just quietly walk away. Yes, that's why what happened this morning is so hard to understand and talk about. The atmosphere grew heavier. The kids waited patiently for their dad to gather his thoughts. This morning, your mom asked me to just drop her off at the domestic terminal and leave. She said she was nervous about leaving you home alone for too long. I agreed and instead drove straight to the international terminal. I waited by the Bali flight check-in and watched Mr. Peter Auer. I stayed hidden for a while. After about 15 minutes, I saw your mother arrive and check in too. I was too shocked to talk to her. You think... Yes, Sarah, I believe your mother was not honest with us. It looks like she has gone to Bali to be with someone she works with. Their father turned away, but his children could see he was in pain. They had never seen him cry before, and they would have given anything to take away his hurt. One by one, they hugged him, starting with Danielle. Sarah spoke up again. What will you do, Dad? I just don't know, kids. If she is with another man, that would be the end for us. Trust is what makes a marriage work, and any break in that trust is hard to forgive. But even if she hasn't, I'm not sure I can get past her dishonesty. That's why I just sent a message to both of them to say that if they get too close, there will be problems. I need time to think about what to do next. Does that make sense? Sarah nodded for all of them and then shared something he didn't know. Dad, Mom left her phone at home. She didn't get your message. I can reach her if you want me to tell her to stay away from him. No, Sarah. I want her to reply for her own reasons. A choice made out of fear isn't a real choice. She needs to have the right reasons. What number did she give you to contact her? Sarah took out her phone and looked at her mom's email. She read the first six numbers to her father, who then gave her the last four from a business card in his pocket. This simple action showed that they were all in this together. Silence filled the room. There's more, Dad. Mom asked me to get a letter for you from under your pillow at home. She pulled it from her bag and handed it to him. They waited while he read. He hesitated to read it out loud once he saw what it said. Young Larry broke the silence. Dad, that letter is about our family. We've always made big decisions together. 
You need to tell us. Dave looked at his youngest son with pride. Here he was, facing the toughest situation their family had seen, and Larry was handling it better than he could. They hugged again, and then Dave started to read. He went through it three times, focusing on the important part the last two times. Without that part, the letter seemed like a caring note from a wife to her husband, but one line made everything else questionable. I'm away for two weeks with a friend from work. I have never been unfaithful to you and won't be without your consent. One lie made everything else hard to trust. After an hour of thoughtful discussion, they came to a conclusion about their mother's actions that was close to the truth. With other options set aside, they realized that, based on one question, their mother might not deserve to be part of their family anymore. Dave tried to stand up for her absence. Kids, if something has gone wrong, it's between me and your mom. Don't let that change how you treat her. Larry spoke for them all. No, Dad. The moment she wasn't honest with us is the moment she took herself out of our family. Dave looked at his son, seeing the determination in his eyes and realizing Larry had his own strength. Laura surprised Pete at the hotel by asking for a separate room on a different floor. She booked it for two days with a chance to stay longer if needed. Pete checked in, looking curiously at Laura. She told him to think about things, then suggested he go unpack and meet her in the lobby in two hours. He agreed, albeit confused. When they met, Peter hadn't done much thinking. But when he saw Laura's outfit, he felt drawn to her. They had been together for a month now, but their intimacy had been limited. What's going on, Laura? Think about it, Peter. We planned this trip together, and then you get a message telling you that if you engage with that woman, you will regret it. That message showed up soon after a man who resembled my husband acted threateningly towards you. Do you understand? Once we got here, my daughter told me my husband is behaving very differently. He hasn't answered my calls for three hours, which is unusual for him. Pete wasn't foolish. He knew what this could imply, but didn't care much about how it affected him. I think it's very likely my husband knows we're together. I don't know how he found out, but I'm certain if he learns about our relationship, it would complicate my marriage. That's not a risk I want to take. If I was completely sure he knew, I would already be on a plane home. But if he doesn't know and I return early, how could I explain it without lying? After being married for 25 years, he would see right through it. I'm sorry, Peter, but we can't continue until I talk to my husband and ensure he doesn't know anything. Peter looked disappointed. Laura could sense he was about to argue, so she paused him. Peter, if you were my husband and thought I was with another man, how would you feel? I'd want to uncover the truth. Laura could see that he was starting to grasp her point. She was frustrated that he didn't fully understand the seriousness of her situation. Have you tried reaching out to your wife since you got here? This caught his attention. Peter started scanning the lobby, concerned. Good. Now you understand. I'll be alone in my room tonight and tomorrow. When my husband returns and can call me, we'll see what happens. For now, please don't come to my room or approach me unless it's in public. And if my husband tries to call, let it go to voicemail. Come find me as soon as possible. Here are the numbers he might call from. Now give me a friendly kiss on the cheek, and we'll go our separate ways. Peter complied, and then they both returned to their rooms, looking around for any signs of being observed. If they had checked the number Pete had received a warning from, they would have known that Laura was much more aware of the situation than she initially believed. Chapter 4 Four days later, the trip was not going as planned. Meals were taken in the hotel restaurant, and they maintained their distance. Laura took Peter shopping for clothes, and they even went on a day trip together on Tuesday. If someone was watching them, they were experienced. Laura insisted they stay close in case Dave called. On Monday, Laura bought a disposable phone and had Peter practice forwarding his calls to it just in case. Her stress was slightly up. It was school holidays, and it wasn't impossible that Dave had taken their kids to the cabin for more than just the weekend. Sarah not replying to her emails was also troubling. Peter couldn't hold out until Tuesday night. He left early, booked another room, and slipped away after checking for any signs of being observed. On Wednesday, Laura was concerned enough to stay in her room all day and do some research online about divorces. Then she contacted her lawyer at home, asking for confirmation about her thoughts on a potential divorce outcome, 
She usually handled all their family legal issues. He replied that while it wasn't his area of expertise, he thought she was right. After repeatedly trying to call Dave and Sarah with no answer, her anxiety grew. She felt disconnected from everyone she knew, which made her lonelier than ever. She sent a heartfelt email to Sarah asking for a reply. Dave didn't use email. By Friday, with no response, Laura began to think about securing her future. She had her lawyer lock up the family finances. She placed the title of their only remaining piece of land in a trust with Sarah and herself as trustees, allowing either of them to access it. The majority of the family funds were put into two separate trusts for their minor children. This time, both signatures were needed. She wanted her signature but let her lawyer convince her that it should be the child's legal guardian instead. This way, it would be more secure, he assured her. The child's signature wouldn't matter until they turned 18. Feeling reassured that she could manage the finances if things went poorly, while also knowing she could reverse it all if required, Laura finally slept peacefully. Two big pieces of news came in just an hour apart on Saturday. The first was from Peter, who came to her room despite her wishes. Worried about his wife not responding, he asked his brother to check on her. His brother told him that she was already asking where to send the divorce papers. She had called his workplace and learned he was on vacation, not a business trip. That explained how Dave found out. Peter decided to fly home immediately to handle things. Laura quickly contacted her lawyer to make sure all her changes were signed before she saw Peter off to the airport and moved into his empty room. The second piece of news hit closer to home and was much more upsetting. She had been checking her younger children's social media accounts but hadn't seen any new posts since she left. But this time there was a new update on Larry's page. He announced to everyone that his parents were getting a divorce. No! Laura cried out in an empty room far from her family. What was David doing? Divorce should come after discussions, arguments, and explanations. Yes, sometimes even needing to apologize. The children? Sure, she worked a lot, as she was the main provider. But Dave had supported her through her studies, so this had gone too far. She thanked any god who might be listening, relieved that she had paused her plans with Pete before anything developed further. Soon, Dave would have proof that nothing had transpired. And now that Peter was gone, nothing would happen. After calming down, she began to think clearly. With no one around, she used her good sense to try to understand things from Dave's perspective. She made some educated guesses. Someone must have learned about her trip to Bali, that someone likely wasn't Dave since he didn't know how to use their computer where the trip details were stored. It was probably Peter's wife who told Dave, perhaps even on the morning of the flight. All he could know for sure was that she had misled him about where she was going and was with Peter. Unless, what if Sarah had read the letter she had asked her not to? What if Sarah had told Dave about it? Laura quickly retrieved the letter to read it for herself. It took her three tries, each time her heart racing more. The first part was straightforward, stating facts without issues. The second part started to twist the truth but remained mostly true. The third part mixed some truths with outright lies, and Dave might be aware of that now. Although Peter was a great partner, she had grown tired of being with him, a fact that was clear to her and, if he had seen the letter, likely clear to Dave as well. The investigation would show that she wasn't with a girlfriend and had a male friend unknown to her husband, which was not right. She realized that if Dave saw that letter as misleading, he would question everything else she had said. Even her praise of him would seem untrustworthy. Suddenly, she understood the real issue. Peter was right. She had shaken Dave's confidence in their relationship. He would feel hurt, but she hadn't betrayed him. The investigation report should confirm that for this trip, at least. He might think she had been unfaithful before now, but Laura had a plan to defend herself. When had the investigator begun watching? If it was as soon as they checked into the hotel, they would know that needing separate rooms was an afterthought. Too many uncertainties loomed in her mind. The letter, which had seemed so caring and sincere when she wrote it, now felt empty if he regarded it as insincere. In hindsight, it revealed itself as a collection of misunderstandings. She hoped he hadn't seen it. If he hadn't, she would have some persuasive words to share. If he had, she doubted any convincing would help. The irony of her situation almost made her smile. 
The investigator's report remained her only hope, showing nothing had happened in Bali. She hoped the investigator was competent, taking comfort in the fact that they had been so skilled at their job that she hadn't noticed them at all. Laura mentally scolded herself. Why had she gotten into this situation? After a long night of reflection, aided by some drinks, she felt like a classic wife who had everything but yearned for more. A successful businesswoman, she had spent her career concealing truths and making choices she now regretted. As she approached a pivotal moment in her life, old desires began to resurface. She believed she could pursue them without repercussions, counting on her intelligence and her husband's trust. The irony of her situation didn't bring her comfort, as she realized she could be a competent professional, yet still feel unfulfilled. The following morning, with no clear answers in sight, Laura resolved to return home as quickly as possible. First, she planned to use her negotiation skills to persuade Dave to reconsider any hasty decisions he might make. She composed an email to David through Sarah, keeping the content vague given her uncertainty about whether Sarah had shown him her previous letter. Her intention was to prevent a divorce while simultaneously preparing a backup plan in case things took a turn for the worse. Being meticulous, she located counselors in her town and scheduled an appointment with one who appealed to her. Then, she readied herself for the day tour she had arranged four days prior, promising herself she would contact the airline later. Chapter 5 Sarah entered her father's house and overheard the end of a discussion between him and the neighbor. So, other than mentioning your concerns to Peter's wife, what else have you done, Dave? Nothing. Hi, Sarah. You know John from next door, right? He's a lawyer and is offering me some advice. Oh, come on, Dave. After all the help you've given me with my yard, it's the least I can do. Hello, Sarah. Hi, John. Are you here to assist Dad with the situation? Now, now, who said anything about that? All we know is that your mother hasn't been truthful with us and is away for two weeks. I'll wait for her to return before making any significant decisions. Sorry about my naive father, John. He can be a bit clueless. Yesterday, Mom's lawyer contacted me regarding documents that would affect some of Dad's control over our family savings. We checked the accounts and noticed that quite a bit of the money is missing. She's really trying to make a clean break, Dad. You need to accept it. And now, this shows her true colors. Sarah handed her dad two printed pages. He read them and then passed them to John. Dear Sarah, could you print out the attached email and give it to your father? Please don't read it. It's about personal matters between us. Dear David, I think by now you understand I wasn't completely honest about my trip this week. When I return, we need to talk and I hope you will listen to my heartfelt apologies for my poor choices. I ask you to remember two important things, and please, don't act until we've spoken. First, I love you and always will. Second, since we agreed to commit to each other all those years ago, I have been faithful to you. I recognize my recent actions may instill doubt, and I'm prepared to do whatever it takes to demonstrate my sincerity. I suggest you arrange a lie detector test for me when I'm back, hopefully soon. I'm willing to take it right after the airport if you can set that up. You can ask any questions you want. Once we address that, I can apologize for any upset I may have caused. Please don't make any quick decisions. We both know the impact of a divorce. You'd lose the home you've worked hard for and part of the money we plan to use for our future. Think of the children. Divorces often split families apart, and from what I've seen, mothers usually get full custody. It would be difficult for Sarah and Danielle if this caused problems in their relationship with Larry. We both know you care deeply for our children, and not being able to see them often would be really hard for you. So please, let me explain before you act. See you soon. Love. Laura John finished reading the letter. Wow, if it wasn't for what we know about her actions, this would be really moving. What do you mean, John? Well, David, in my job, I see many tricks. This one is pretty common. Your wife has decided she wants out. She finds someone else and goes on a trip to consider her options. Usually, if she finds the new person is the one, she would quietly take the money and assets out of your reach before hitting you with divorce papers. The clever ones create a distance between the parent and children first. Like what Laura is doing with Sarah writing a letter that makes you look vulnerable and letting Sarah find it is one of the sneakiest moves I've seen. 
The best way to win in a divorce is to catch the partner off guard, keep them struggling, and influence the children's choice of whom to stay with. In this case, it would be between a comfortable mom at home or a dad facing difficulties elsewhere. Surely there must be another explanation. I can help with that. Contact the top three divorce lawyers in town. The one or two who won't take your case are likely already representing her. I believe she's set them up to hinder you. What do you mean? That letter is just a cover, David. Her lawyer likely told her that getting custody of kids your age isn't guaranteed anymore, especially since you have a strong case as a hands-on parent. The point of this letter is clear. She wants you to halt any actions while she prepares for what's next. The issue is you caught onto her plan early. Once she's ready, she'll push for the divorce quickly, especially before Larry turns 14 and can express his wishes. Expect her to suggest attending counseling together. Here, a divorce is usually only granted after living apart for a certain time, or if a counselor agrees the marriage can't be fixed. She'll pick the counselor and likely try to persuade you to go. The pressures in her letter are common tactics used in these situations today. Dave excused himself and asked John for the best divorce lawyer in town. After a quick call, he discovered they couldn't take his case. Unbeknownst to him, the lawyer was already busy and had told their receptionist to hold off on accepting new clients. Dave went back to the living room. Okay, John, I believe you. What should I do next? First, let's secure the finances that Laura hasn't already handled. Then you need to limit her access to any shared accounts. How do I start that? Begin by canceling any shared credit cards. All right, but I still feel uneasy. She sounds so sincere when she professes her love. It doesn't quite match the worries in the second part of her email. Dad, do you really think Mom was honest with you? Yes, I truly do, Sarah. Do you tell untruths to those you care about, Dad? No, I don't. What have you always taught us about the key parts of a good relationship, Dad? Love, trust, and respect, right? How many do you have left? Well, one, now that you mention it. And how many is mother showing you right now? None. Tada. Chapter 6 When Laura tried to pay the fee to change her flight, both of her credit cards were declined. She hurried to an ATM she had used before, but it wouldn't work either. She entered panic mode. Luckily, her hotel and meals were paid for so she wouldn't face hunger or homelessness. She had a few hundred in travel checks for emergencies, but that wouldn't cover the additional costs. With no friends nearby to borrow from, she was left with one option, her parents. Asking them for money would lead to questions she didn't want to answer right now. She quickly emailed her lawyer about the bank accounts and mentally prepared herself for a boring week without spending until her flight. She couldn't believe how her simple plan to feel better had spiraled so quickly, putting Dave in a tough spot. She understood he wouldn't forgive her betrayal. She had taken a risk, knowing the chances of being caught were slim. Why had he reacted so strongly? He likely thought she was with another man, but she hoped he had realized that nothing happened and the man was gone. He probably didn't know about her financial moves, seeing as he trusted her to handle things like that. As she rested her head on her desk, two emails arrived that didn't help her mood. The first was from Pete's wife, sarcastically thanking her for causing trouble in her marriage and putting her children's future at risk. That one hurt but then she received another email that changed everything. It looked like one of her old emails to Peter, where she expressed excitement about her trip. This one had both her and Peter's email addresses. It was a forwarded message with a simple question. Why did you mislead us, Mom? It was signed, Danielle. Even though her husband wasn't good with computers, her kids clearly were. This was the first time she realized that Dave wasn't the only one affected by her choices. She found no good answer to that question. It also made her think differently about Sarah's silence. Laura cried out of sadness and frustration. Then she emailed Danielle, promising to explain the misunderstanding when she got home. Her daughter replied quickly, It's strange you chose to spend our school holidays with another man rather than dad and us. Laura cried again. The week was full of stress and boredom. Sticking to a tight budget meant she had little to do but lay on the beach. She packed her towel, but after an hour she returned to the hotel. Coming back with a tan would feel like showing off her lies. Out of frustration, she sent a long email home through Sarah. 
Without going into details, she mentioned her poor choices and feeling taken for granted as a wife, mother, and provider. She even touched on her sense of entitlement, hinting that this was her excuse. She stressed that during her marriage, she had only been with Dave. She urged them not to make any hasty decisions until they could talk. Notably missing from the email was any sort of apology. A strong businesswoman didn't apologize when she believed she was in a solid position. She hit send and waited. Chapter 7 All right, kids. It's time to talk about what we'll do when your mom gets back. I'm a bit surprised she's staying over there, but for now we assume she'll be back on Friday as planned. How should we handle it? Remember, all we know is that she went away with a guy from work. Let's hear your thoughts. Sarah, you go first. Well, after reading her last email, Dad, she seems like she thinks she's above it all, treating us like we're just something in her way. Whether or not this is her first time deceiving us doesn't matter to me. She had a choice. She could have taken time off to spend with us or run off with someone else. She already spends so little time with Danielle and Larry because of her long hours. I think how she acted before and after it all came to light is disrespectful and dishonest. Unless she has a major change of heart, I'm done with her. Okay, Sarah. Harsh but fair. What about you, Danielle? I just don't think she really understands what she's done, Dad. I agree, sweetheart. Once we hear from Larry, I'll share my thoughts. Larry? I don't care, Dad. I just want to stay with you. I'll do my best to make that happen, buddy. What do you plan to do, Dad? I think your mom lost her way for a while. After her promotion last year, she seemed to change. Kids, I hope you'll back me on this. If she admits what she's done and really feels regret, I think we should give her another chance. What do you think? Sarah looked at her younger siblings and sensed they agreed. Little kids just want a stable home until they grow up and start challenging their parents' beliefs. All right, Dad, we'll give it a try. But I've read her latest email countless times, and I don't see any sign of regret at all. Strangely, I believed her when she said she had never been unfaithful to you. I agree, Sarah. That's why I've planned something to surprise her. After this, she will understand that we think she has already hurt the family. She seems to think we are only worried about the physical part. Once she realizes how upset we are, the big question will be, what will she do about it? If she apologizes, we can talk it over. If not, we'll see. Now, here's my plan. Chapter 8 Laura was surprised by the return email. It was from Sarah, but looked like it was from Dave and their three kids. It laid out a schedule for her return. After she read it, a sense of worry filled her. It seemed like too much for her to handle. The email said she would be back late Friday afternoon. It mentioned a meeting she had set up with a lie detector company and noted that the questions had come from all four of the kids. After the test, they had booked her a place to stay for two nights so she could reflect on her answers. She could ask for a meeting on Saturday afternoon to discuss the family's future. Laura felt annoyed at being directed, but she decided to go along with their plan for now. One thing was clear. Once she acknowledged her mistakes, there would be serious consequences. People needed to know who was in charge. She felt a bit better. She was glad they were proceeding with the lie detector test. It was the best way to show Dave she had been loyal. She knew if she could convince Dave, the rest would follow. What questions would he ask her? He knew she had behaved in Bali, but the real question was whether she had been with Pete before that. If he asked, Have you ever been with anyone besides your husband? She would feel safe. But she worried that he might ask trickier questions, such as, Have you always acted like a good wife? Then she would be on shaky ground. She hadn't been with Peter in that way the strict sense of the word. And before Peter, there was Michael. They hadn't been together either, but that was because Michael had backed out at the last moment. Laura knew she shouldn't worry too much about the questions. She knew lie detectors measured things like heart rate. Overthinking the questions could make her more stressed and affect the results. Still, she practiced her answers for the questions she thought Dave might ask. Feeling calm, she went to the airport. She had decided not to tell anyone what time her flight arrived. She said it was because everyone would be busy at work or school and took a taxi instead. She didn't want her family showing up at the wrong terminal. As she walked out of customs, she realized how different this arrival was from what she'd expected. Instead of feeling proud, she felt vulnerable. 
After her taxi ride, she waited in the lobby of the lie detector office for an hour until one of the technicians took her inside. He explained the basic steps of the test and how they would tailor it for her. He opened a file and frowned. Oh, that's right. This is unusual. Laura flushed slightly. She understood that soon he would ask questions about her recent past. The questions I have are different from normal. Instead of a list, they're set up like a flowchart. Sorry? Yes, I've seen it a few times. There's a first question, and depending on how you answer, we choose the next one. It might take a bit longer, but it won't change the results, I promise. Are you ready to start? As ready as I can be. The technician began the basic questions and then paused to check the file. Question 9. Two weeks ago, did you go to Bali with the plan of being unfaithful with Mr. Peter Auer? Yes. He looked at the machine's readout and made a note. Laura wasn't surprised by this question. She braced herself for the next one. Would it be about whether she had been unfaithful in Bali or if she had been with Pete before the trip? She hoped it would be something she could deny easily. If they asked, Have you ever been with Peter Ower? She could say no and pass. Please let it be simple. The technician closed the file and started to print out the test results. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. I have the email to send the report to. You're free to leave. To say Laura was shocked would be an understatement. What does this mean? What, just one question? Yes, that's unusual. I've only seen it once before, and it was similar. I think whoever wrote these questions had a point to make. Is it your husband? Laura nodded automatically. What point is he trying to make? The point, I guess, is that he doesn't care if you were unfaithful in Bali. He just wanted to know if you planned to be. That's enough for him. Good luck, Mrs. Brown. There are some business cards for a couple of good divorce lawyers at the front desk. Laura left the room in a daze. She had built her whole argument on convincing her husband that she hadn't been with anyone else. Being someone who didn't take her job seriously, Laura didn't realize how upset Dave was with her dishonesty. Frustrated and angry, Laura made one last poor choice. Instead of taking time to think things over, she jumped into a taxi and went home. In her mind, it was a simple tug of war. Her competitive nature kicked in. Dave had made the first move, and now it was her turn to respond. The taxi dropped her off outside her apartment building. Across the street, Dave, Danielle, and Larry looked at each other with concern as they watched her march toward the family home. They were grateful for their plans from the night before. Dave didn't want to show anger in front of the children. That wouldn't be good for them. They drove to the hotel room they had booked for Laura, making sure their phones were turned off. Chapter 9 No one heard from Laura until Monday. There was a small hope that she had thought things through, but it quickly vanished when an email arrived for Dave through Sarah late on Monday. It criticized him for trying to turn the children against her. It mentioned an emergency family court meeting her lawyer was setting up to talk about temporary custody of Danielle and Larry. As John predicted, it also mentioned an appointment she made for all of them with a counselor the next day. She demanded a family meeting on Wednesday night. Laura had been reflecting all weekend and came up with a plan she believed covered everything. First, she wanted to save the marriage that Dave seemed ready to end. That meant talking to a counselor. A woman, of course, since she thought that might help her explain her feelings to Dave. Next, she wanted a family meeting to clarify her actions to the children. Lastly, she was prepared for a potential court battle, just in case things took a turn for the worse. When Dave arrived at the counselor's office on Tuesday, Laura was already there. He immediately felt uneasy around the woman in her mid-forties, who looked like she came from a different time. The chairs faced each other but were kept apart. After introductions, Laura introduced herself, while Dave was simply called Mr. Brown. The aging counselor invited Laura to speak first. Laura shared their marriage history and told her side of the story. She had been a devoted wife and mother but then made some poor choices. She admitted to being less than truthful with her family and trying to leave with another man. No physical relationship had occurred, as Dave's watchful eye would show, but she did have intentions. She had been shocked to find her credit cards were canceled while she was away. She expressed her regret and her hope to move forward with her marriage to Dave. The counselor turned to Dave. I represent not only myself, but also our children. 
Their biggest issue is that their mother was not forthcoming and took time off work to be away without notifying anyone. She even left her phone behind, making it hard to reach her if something went wrong. To be clear, I didn't hire anyone to follow Laura while she was away. Laura was taken aback by this. She couldn't believe he had not tried to find out what she was doing. It's true. I didn't want to believe she was being unfaithful until our youngest daughter found evidence of the plans Laura made. I had to cancel the credit cards when our eldest discovered she was trying to take control of our finances without me. Once again, Laura was shocked. She hadn't realized her actions were being scrutinized and hadn't thought about how they would affect her family. The fact that both her daughters were against her didn't help her mood either. As for what Laura wants from this process, I find it hard to believe anything she says now, he said. His harsh words made it clear to Laura just how hurt he was. Before she could respond, the counselor asked Dave, What do you hope to achieve by being here today? I want to understand why my wife felt it was okay to lie to her family and plan to leave with another man. At that moment, their marriage still had a chance to heal. But everything changed instantly. Not because of either of them, but because of the counselor who quietly muttered, Oh, we have a dinosaur. Dave, feeling that Laura had set this up to push for a divorce and had chosen the counselor to hurt his chances of reconciliation, lost his temper. He had heard of counselors like this and thought it wasn't fair. He stormed out. Laura might have followed him to apologize, but instead she took her frustration out on the counselor. By the time she finished, Dave was long gone. The counselor apologized and suggested Laura have a one-on-one -on -one session with her the next week. Then she would also apologize to Dave for her words and have a private meeting with him as well. That would be the third required session, leading to a decision about what to do next. Chapter 10 The family meeting the following day didn't go well for Laura. She just couldn't understand what was happening. Once trust is broken, it becomes a distant memory like an old story about an extinct creature. She invited everyone over for dinner before the meeting, but Sarah reminded her that cooking wasn't her strong suit, and they agreed to meet at 7.30 p.m. Laura tried to greet everyone warmly, but they all seemed distant. Sitting down last turned out to be a mistake. When she was finally ready, she found herself alone, facing four pairs of curious eyes on the couch. She hoped her best friend Sarah would move beside her, but that didn't happen. Feeling frustrated again, Laura began her speech. It had fewer apologies and more explanations, focusing on how she didn't actually do anything wrong. She felt unappreciated as both a woman and the main provider for her family. The warmth from her husband felt expected, and she missed the attention that some women receive. As she started to feel her age and less attractive, she found herself drawn to the attention of a younger man. While talking, she mainly focused on Danielle and Larry avoiding Dave's gaze, who seemed preoccupied taking notes behind raised knees. The silence from her children felt heavy, making her quiet too. Then Sarah spoke up. Mom, you let me down again. What do you mean? On the cliché meter, I can only give you 85%. If you'd said that no one would get hurt if they didn't find out, I could have given you 100%. No one could tell if Laura's face turned red from anger or embarrassment. She realized that she should have included that point, but forgot. She saw that she would get little sympathy from her kids while Dave seemed to have sway over them. David, come to the kitchen, please. As soon as they were behind closed doors, she turned to him, her voice low and tense. Does it have to be like this, David? Me breaking you until you come back, asking for my forgiveness? Dave met her gaze, sadness in his eyes as he recognized her struggle. No, it doesn't need to be like this at all. If you would just do what you know is right, things wouldn't have to end this way. If you stopped listening to the wrong people, and we went to see... I'll see you in court, David. On Thursday, Dave moved into a rented three-bedroom house. It was clear this situation was far from over. He learned that there would be a preliminary hearing about custody of Danielle and Larry the following Tuesday. When he called his friend John, he found out he had drawn the judge who was known for favoring mothers in custody cases. Dave declined John's offer for help, but asked to meet over the weekend to understand what to expect in court. He wanted to make sure he did everything right for his children's emotional well-being. The weekend turned out to be fun as Dave and the kids made the house feel like home. 
He talked openly about what to expect in the short term and shared his longer-term plans. This cheered them up, and they worked together to figure out what they needed. On Tuesday, Laura's lawyer was surprised to discover that Dave wanted to represent himself. This put Laura in a difficult position, answering questions from her husband. The court ran late that day, so only simple matters were discussed, and everyone was told to return the next day. Word spread quickly to a few local reporters. The next day started with Laura's lawyer discussing property ownership and income details. Then it was Dave's turn to ask questions. Laura looked nervous, which the reporters noticed. He began gently. Did I build our family home with my own two hands? Yes, you did. I was busy working and making most of the money, she replied. Did you go back to work within two months after each of our children was born? Yes. Who usually prepared our children's meals? You did. I was working long hours. Would you say I was the main caregiver? Possibly. When you went on your trip, did you leave a letter for me to find? Dave then read the letter aloud. He could see the reporters writing it down, while Laura's face showed her distress. After returning from your trip, did you apologize for your actions? This time, silence was her answer. Your Honor, I have always been the primary caregiver for our children. They should remain with me, along with the home I built for them. I never cheated on my wife, and I never told harmful lies to her or our kids. I challenge her to prove otherwise— her actions have shown that she should not have any more influence over our children. Dave sat down with his back turned to Laura, who glared at him with anger. The judge quickly made her decision, noting that many studies indicate that children fare better with their mother in divorce cases. As a result, she granted Laura temporary custody and the family home. Laura smiled with satisfaction, while Dave remained composed, knowing this was what he expected after talking with John. He stood up. Your Honor, may I speak? he asked. I want to point out your own past decisions in similar cases where custody was given to the main caregiver. With no reply from the judge, Dave referenced three studies that suggested children are not always better off with the mother. What are you trying to say, Mr. Brown? the judge asked. I was wondering, Your Honor, is it possible for a father to win in your court? The judge glared at him, but he held her gaze. She then closed the case and moved on to the next. The reporters took notes quickly. Dave handed out copies of Laura's letter to them, then left without looking back. Laura's lawyer came over to congratulate her, but she felt no joy. Dave's words about her lack of remorse had struck a nerve. Her need to win every argument made it hard for her to back down. With his marriage now finalized by Laura's smug look, Dave added up all those who had wronged him and decided they needed to learn a lesson. There were three people on that list, and he had already discussed his ideas with Sarah for feedback. She had even suggested something better than he had planned. He went home and, through a connection, sent an email to the chief judge, sharing his concerns about bias in certain cases. He then waited for Danielle and Larry to come home from school. They agreed to spend the next two nights with their mother. He also gave them some materials for his next steps. The following day, Two articles in the newspaper painted unflattering pictures of both Laura and the judge. Dave cut them out and emailed them to a contact. Chapter 12 On Wednesday afternoon, Laura returned home to find Danielle and Larry there, though they made it clear they didn't want to be. They spoke only when necessary, and she had to be reminded to make lunches for school the next day. It had been so long since she had done that she forgot. She ended up giving them money for lunch instead. She left again at 4 p.m. to prepare for her counseling session at 5 p.m. At the session, Laura spent half the time stating the conditions under which she'd take Dave back. The rest was spent as the counselor asked about their marriage history. Laura admitted to two past relationships before Peter, one with a co-worker and another with a neighbor. She insisted that nothing really happened, failing to mention that in the first two cases, she hadn't wanted those situations. She was puzzled by Dave's strong feelings, claiming there was nothing to be upset about. The counselor agreed to speak with Dave about her conditions, but warned that reconciliation seemed unlikely, as Dave's objections were rooted in honesty and intent. The next day, Dave's session was brief, but a bit daunting. When asked what he wanted, he presented two options. 
He either wanted a referral to another counselor, one who didn't openly accept infidelity, or a confirmation that their marriage was over. Seeing that her earlier remarks might harm her career, the counselor quickly reported to the relevant authorities that the marriage was finished. She realized that one more negative report could jeopardize her job. When Dave returned home, he found Danielle and Larry settled in. Suddenly, a policeman knocked on their door, saying that he was in violation of a family court order. Dave pointed out that it was the children who were not complying. He explained that any attempt to remove them without their consent would be wrong. The officer asked the kids to come with him, but they refused. He left to seek further instructions. Before he returned, Laura stormed in. David, I've told you before, it doesn't have to be like this. Just ask Danielle and Larry to come with me. Give me the house and I'll be fair about visitation and dividing our things. Laura, please leave my home. I will not force the children into something they don't want and that could affect their well-being. David, we've known each other for a long time. You know I'm not a bad person. That's just it, Laura. I don't know you anymore. The person I married wouldn't have acted this way. She wouldn't have done what you did and then shown no regret telling our counselor to give me an ultimatum about accepting your choices or losing everything important to me. I certainly didn't expect to learn about your past relationships before Peter during our counseling session yesterday. Tell me, Laura, what did I do to deserve this treatment from you, and what are you planning to do next? Laura felt a surge of anger. She realized that the counselor had betrayed her trust, but she couldn't take her frustration out on Dave. Instead, all her anger was directed at the counselor. She shouldn't have told you that. Dave didn't respond to her comment. In a fit of anger, Laura left. Afterward, Dave quietly erased the recording that the counselor had slipped into Laura's purse. He believed that the counselor would soon face consequences for her actions, and he was right. Three days later, the counselor was informed that her services were no longer needed. One down, two to go. On Saturday morning, child services arrived, but they soon left in frustration. It was clear that the children wouldn't leave without a fight. The senior officer told Larry, The courts have decided you're better off with your mother. Then the courts are wrong. Neither Danielle nor I want to live with someone who has been dishonest and has hurt our dad, Larry replied. That ended the discussion. For the next week, Laura tried to mend her relationship with her children, but they refused to talk to her. They deleted her emails and phone messages. She attempted to speak with Dave, but he cut the conversation short once he realized she wasn't going to apologize. In the end, he hired a divorce lawyer and consulted Sarah's boss to confirm the advice she had given him. By the end of that week, Dave learned through Sarah that Laura was going on another business trip. He took a week off work and put in a lot of effort, with the help of the kids after school. Laura didn't know what was happening until she returned home the following Friday. Driving into her driveway, she was taken aback. Her well-kept yard was there, along with the brick garage, but her beautiful house was gone. In its place was a damaged building, clearly bought after an insurance auction. As she stood in shock, she noticed Dave had changed the locks. Inside, she found some of her clothes, furniture, and personal items. She felt torn between anger and sadness but sadness overwhelmed her for a moment. Lying on the floor was a copy of the property title. She read the address and realized that she had been outsmarted. The land officially belonged to her, and there was a building on it. She called her lawyer to see if there was anything she could do about the house. Then she phoned her financial advisor to change her arrangements. However, she learned that Sarah had already moved the land deeds to her name. Fueled by anger at her own mistake, Laura understood how deeply her family felt against her. Dave for taking her house, and the children for not supporting her. Desperate for some understanding, she sent an email to her kids. Do you really feel this way about me? The reply was simple. We don't feel that way. You've always known I'd do what it takes to protect our family. Unfortunately, you've put me in a position where I must protect them from you. It was signed, Dave. After gathering some personal items, Laura checked into a motel. On the way, she drove past Sarah's place and confirmed that her old house's parts were there, waiting to be put back together. On Monday at work, she received Dave's divorce petition. He apologized for sending it there, explaining he didn't know where else to reach her. 
For the next hour, she tried to understand the terms, which seemed generous at first glance. It granted her full ownership of their shared property. However, it listed several deductions, including costs for a hotel in Bali and fees related to the divorce, along with expenses for fixing her financial issues. It also stated that the children could choose which parent to live with. If they disagreed, Larry would get to decide. Laura called her financial advisor to see if she could reverse the trusts in the children's names, but he told her it was impossible. Through her divorce lawyer, Laura tried to get a different counselor, but since the first had already been involved, that would require Dave's agreement. When she requested that, Dave reminded her he had already suggested another counselor weeks ago, and she had turned it down. Now that Laura seemed only focused on her own situation, it was too late for her to change direction. She signed the agreement, knowing it was the best option available. With the family court likely to grant her custody of her children, Danielle and Larry, she was set to gain control over their trusts. This meant she would only lose the value of one parcel of land. Once everything was official, the divorce went through quickly. Her lawyer assured her that they would have the same family court judge, who was known for being one-sided. He often advised his male clients against opposing her, suggesting they save their money instead. Feeling confident that her plan was progressing well, Laura felt relaxed. She wondered if Dave's pride would make him reconsider their relationship, where she would be accommodating but with conditions, or if he would accept his situation with resentment. Chapter 13 With her confidence back, Laura walked into court a month later, only to be met by her concerned lawyer. He pointed out a woman in a suit sitting in the front row. Do you see her? I went to law school with her. I heard she now works in a high-ranking legal office. I feel like something is off, he said, looking worried, and his anxiety rubbed off on Laura. The judge began the proceedings by announcing this would be her last case before retiring early, which seemed to bother her. Then the lawyers started speaking. Laura's lawyer countered Dave's request that she pay all the legal fees by suggesting they split the costs. However, Dave's lawyer didn't agree, stating he was representing Dave pro bono. From that point on, things did not go well for Laura. Dave's lawyer painted a clear picture of both parents and their abilities as guardians. Laura's lawyer appeared unprepared and wished he had focused more on the facts. The case lasted all morning and seemed one-sided. The judge finally made a decision right then. She looked at the suited woman in the audience and spoke with a tone indicating her insincerity. She stated that as the main caregiver, Dave would get custody of the children. She even congratulated him on his generous offer regarding their possessions and hoped he would do well raising them. Laura was so stunned that she didn't even hear the final ruling. Returning to her small apartment, she felt as if she had been hit by a bus, but staying in sadness wasn't an option. She had a property settlement to attend. To prepare for this financial decision, she had put her old property up for sale. The land was difficult to work with and only suitable for a specific kind of house, so she had set a low price. Unless someone built her old house exactly as it was, including the landscape that had once been beautiful thanks to Dave's design, she wouldn't make much. Later that day, she wanted to hand over the title deeds to the new owners herself and wish them joy in their new home. But when the agent arrived, he informed her that he was just representing the buyers and they would arrive shortly. When Laura spotted Dave's car, followed by trucks carrying parts of her old house and a crane, she decided to leave. At her new place, she looked at the small check in her hand, the only reward she had left after everything had changed in her life. Feeling a bit numb, she took out a diary her friend had suggested she use to cope. With a red marker, she wrote in big letters, Next time you have a problem, go to the pharmacy. Next time you mess up, apologize. You're not as smart as you think. After about eight weeks, it was time for Laura to reflect on her feelings. She bought a bottle of champagne to congratulate the new homeowners before heading over to see them.